Welcome everyone to day two of our Progressive Learning Conference hosted by Dino. My name is Tierra Lustig. I am a marketing manager here at Dino and I will be your event facilitator today. Hopefully you all were able to join us for Tara Martin's keynote speech yesterday. It was a great presentation. Um, great to hear from her and hear her kick off the week with some really important and impactful um, information on how to be real with education. So hopefully you could join us for that. If not, we have some great breakout sessions this week that are happening. Tuesday through Friday. So we're excited to have you join us for all of those. As you know, progressive learning has really come to the forefront of education, especially with the ongoing remote learning that's been happening for the past semester and into this semester. So we really wanted to dedicate a conference to talk about all of these different progressive learning styles, why they're important and how you can really maximize them in your school or district. So today we are talking all about personalized learning with Jill Thompson. Um, before we jump into our session today, I just want to cover off on a few kind of housekeeping and information to give you all so that you can engage with us to the best, um, best of your abilities during the conference. So at Dino, we're dedicated to creating content and helping educators learn from one another and learn from people who are experts in their own industries and in their own fields. So we do this by having conversations with people from all over the country and the world about how they're using different tactics and strategies in education. So we have our Tackling Tech podcast, Brett McGrath, our VP of Marketing hosts that, and he does those episodes once a week. They're great conversations about leveraging technology and collaboration in K-12 education our ed tech blog that is on fire. We are posting on that every single day. And we take those conversations from the podcast and really break them down into digestible bits of content. Um, our Tech Coach Corner YouTube series, that is something that I host on our YouTube channel. We take our guests from the Tackling Tech podcast and I have a conversation with them about one tactic or strategy that they talk about on the podcast, break that down into a really digestible short video that you can learn from. So go check that out. Those drop Mondays and Thursdays. And last but not least, our Tech Coach Con event series. You are obviously aware of this because you're joining us today for our conference, but we are having these events consistently. We had our remote learning conference as well as our professional development conference leading up to this conference. So we would love for you to engage with these uh, different events in the future. We have some really exclusive and exciting offers for all of you who are attending today. So I'm gonna kick it off to Brett so he can tell you about this. Thank you, Tierra. We are really excited for two special announcements today. So the first announcement is the launch of the Progressive Learning Partner Program. We have spent the last several months having conversations with unbelievably talented and bright educators from all over the country. And the common theme and thread that is woven throughout those conversations is the importance of progressive learning. We're throwing a conference today to talk about progressive learning, so we're super fired up about it. One thing we realized in this process is that we can't be the only voice sharing progressive learning stories with our audience and our network. So what we wanted to do was bring together some of the best content creators around progressive learning and make sure that we were delivering curated playlists to your inbox on a regular basis. So if you're watching this live or watching this recording, you're gonna be the first to know about. As you can see, um, we've already got some incredible sponsors here that are gonna be a part of the program, many of which um, are presenting here today. So thank you so much for your early support, more to come. And if there are people within your network that you're learning for, from that are cr creating a podcast or have a YouTube channel around progressive learning, send me an email at bmcgrath at dino.com. I'd love to reach out to them and have them be a part of the program. The second announcement is something that I am really, really excited about, and that aligns with the Dino product and your schools in your school's progressive learning programs. So we get a lot of questions about the Dino product, whether it's on the podcast or through direct messages. And so what we wanted to do was extend an offer for Dino. And Dino, just in case you don't know, Dino is a student device monitoring uh, software that works in person, in remote, and in a hybrid learning environment. It helps empower teachers to passively or actively monitor devices as the autonomy between students and teachers increases 
with distance, blended, and all these progressive learning styles that we are talking about today. So we're extending a 30% discount on the 2021 school year um, for anyone who signs up for that. So you can follow the link to learn more about that. This offer will expire on November 13th, so you'll need to get signed up for no, by November 13th. But if you have any questions, again, you can reach out to me at bmcgrath at dino.com. Make sure you get those answered. Without further ado, I'll kick it back over to you, Tiara. Thanks, Brett. Um, let's go ahead and continue with our logistics and what you can expect for the rest of the week of this conference. So. Today, like I said, we are talking all about personalized learning with Jill Thompson. Tomorrow, we have a great session on STEM with Chris Woods. Thursday, we're talking all about flipped learning with um, Treefish EDU, who are Eric Geis, Kyle Nemus, and Nick Johnson. And last but not least, we're gonna have a great breakout session from George Valenzuela on SEL, PBL, and equity. So I think we're really covering the spectrum of progressive learning. We're excited for you all to join us for these uh, sessions. And you will all, if you're registered, receive an email at the beginning of each day with a link to watch the session recording um, at noon Eastern time. So be sure to look out for that email so you can join us for the sessions. All right, we're almost through the housekeeping, so bear with me. What you can expect today. So you are obviously watching the session recording now through a link uh, that you were sent this morning. These sessions will be available to everyone if you didn't register on 928 next Monday, and those will be available through our YouTube channel. So go ahead and subscribe to Dino on YouTube so that you don't miss those when they drop on the YouTube channel. Because you're watching a recorded session and not a live session, we want to replicate the conference experience as much as possible, which is why we are hosting Twitter chats throughout each day of the conference. So today there will be a Twitter chat at noon and at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Those will be about 30 to 45 minutes and we're just going to kind of give you some prompts, give you some questions, get your feedback and try to lead a, a discussion while you're watching Jill's presentation. And that will be hosted through the hashtag DinoPLC. And feel free to use this hashtag to share your thoughts if you're not available to join us during each of the Twitter chats. We'd love to know what you think. We'd love you to tag Jill, tag Dino, let us know what you think about the, the presentation and let us know your thoughts and any questions you have for Jill. I'm sure she'll be happy to get back to you on Twitter. And then last but not least, everybody I'm sure is looking to get PD credit for attending these different conferences. So on Monday, when you receive the links with the session recordings, you will also receive a certificate of attendance if you did attend the of the breakout sessions or the kickoff keynote yesterday. So keep an eye out for that email on Monday. And if you have any issues with the certificate of attendance, feel free to email me back at Tierra tlustig at dino.com. All right, I think we're ready to jump in. So today we have a great session with Jill Thompson. I'm excited to learn from Jill about personalized learning. Jill's presentation is titled Beginning to Personalize Learning with Core Practices. Uh, Jill, I'm going to give a quick, quick introduction to yourself and then I'll let you jump into your presentation. So Jill, we connected a few months ago. Jill's an associate partner at Education Elements where she works with districts around the country to solve their biggest challenges. Prior to working with Education Elements, she was the Director of Personalized Learning at Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, which also happens to be a Dino customer, and she was responsible for leading the Charlotte Mecklenburg transformation in a highly complex, large urban environment. She developed a personalized data-driven model to provide professional learning and created micro-credentialing learning paths. So, Jill, you are an expert in, in sorry, personalized learning, so we're excited to have you today. I'm gonna to stop sharing my screen. Um, how are you doing today? Uh, you're muted, Jill, sorry. Thank you so much for having me. I am very excited to be here. Um, it wouldn't be 2020 if we didn't say, oh, you're being muted. So <laughs> thank you for that, adding that piece there too. Of course. Really excited to be with everybody today and excited to um, be a part of the Twitter chats as well this week. So we'll get started. Go ahead. Okay, we'll get started. So we're gonna take a deep dive into these core four and um, wanna just kind of share with you what our overview is going to be for today for our session so you know what you're walking away with. And we're really um, going to be thinking about 
understanding the core for personalized learning and how you can start implementing this into your classroom tomorrow, taking those small steps to make changes in um, your learning environment. And then we'll also provide you with structures to think through so you can start thinking about what that transition is going to look like. Because a lot of times with personalized learning, everybody wants to start off with doing everything at once. And we have found that teachers are most successful when you try one thing, master that, and then move on just like we do um, with students in our classroom. So those are our two learning goals for today. At Education Elements, we have a model, a framework that we use that we call Elements of Building Knowledge. And so we go through what we call a spark, and that's understanding why the idea that we're talking about matters. And it's kind of like in the classroom where you're prepping the students' knowledge, you're getting them excited about the topic and making some of those connections. Then our expand is our mini lesson. That's where we'll explore resources and deepen our knowledge around the content. We also have a practice where we start thinking about the ideas and safe ways of what that's gonna look like in the classroom and then start planning. What are those next steps that you're gonna take? As research shows that when you say you're gonna take these next steps and you do those within a few days, you tend to be more successful in implementation in the classroom. So we do want you to walk away with saying that this is the one thing that I'm going to do moving forward. So we're going to jump into a spark and we're going to do something a little bit unique. And what we're going to do is I want you to um, pause this video for about two minutes and I want you to draw a duck. All right, very simple. That's all your instructions. I just want you to draw a duck. So pause this video, take two minutes and draw a duck. All right, so it's time to look at your duck and show off your duck if you're with um, your PLC or some other members doing this webinar together. And you probably see lots of different ducks. You might see some characters here. Or you might be very simple duck. But what I wanted you to draw was this duck. And I'm curious, why wouldn't you draw this duck? And part of those things are, is because the instruction I gave you, I didn't give you a specific diagram. I didn't give you a size reference to really think about how big or small it needed to be. I didn't say you could work together with somebody else or talk or collaborate. Um, I also didn't set clear expectations um, besides saying you have two minutes. These are all things that we do as well to teachers. We say, I said, go build a duck. Oftentimes just to tell teachers, go do personalized learning. And we have no structures in place to really understand what personalized learning looks like. And so today we're gonna to take that deep dive into these core four, really look at what personalized learning looks like so we can have those guardrails. Going into our expands, let's take that deep dive. So the constraints of a traditional classroom, we have our time, space, routines, communication, and accountability. And now we're in this new era where we have this more virtual, virtual learning, where we might have gone back to school um, the beginning of the school year in a remote setting, or maybe a hybrid, or maybe we were face-to-face. -face. But now we have um, to think about things differently. And so, Thinking about things differently, the number one undercurrent thing is that we really want students to become self-directed learners. And to be able to do that, we really need to take a step back and think about what that's going to look like. And so for education elements, we have these four foundational um, instructional pieces that provides that area of focus and allows that common language no matter what grade level you're in, no matter what subject area you teach, and it provides what I call the guardrails. And so the four that we focus in on are flexible, cool and flexible content and tools, targeted instruction, student reflection and ownership, and data-driven decisions. With a big circle around that being whole child, because that's the most important. We wanna make sure that we know our students' strengths and areas of growth and how we can help them be successful. So let's take a deep dive into these. So the first one is targeted instruction. Targeted instruction is really thinking about focusing on groups of students that are seven or less. Within these groups, we really wanna think about targeting the skills that's based on their level. So using that data to drive the instruction of those small groups. 
And you also want to think about differentiating the content. And you can do this multiple ways. But one of the most important things to think about is how that small group direct instruction is going to meet more of your students' needs. If you haven't watched the TED Talk by Todd Rose called um, The Myth of Average, or The End of Average, it's a great TED um, Talk to watch because it really talks about how we need to meet, meet the students where they are and not teach to the average. When we teach whole group instruction, that's what happens is we, we teach to the average and we don't meet all the students' needs. But in a small group direct instruction, we can meet more of the students' needs and really help them progress and move along. So what does that look like in the classroom? So there are three instructional models that we focus in on to what this looks like in the classroom. And I'm gonna share what it looks like in all different learning um, models and environments because each of the school districts across the country are looking a little bit different this year. So the first, for the three instructional models, um, we have station rotation, we have workshop, and then a flipped classroom. So first, thinking about station rotation, this is where really in the beginning of the class, no matter if it's virtual, hybrid, or um, again, face-to-face, -face, students are coming together. They will have a 10 to 15 minute, maybe it's a check-in, it could be a mini lesson, it could be a pre-assessment, but something that's when to, you're gonna do as a whole group together. Then moving into different station rotations where you'll have three groups, sometimes you can have four or more depending on your data, but having these groups and each of these groups are going to be focusing on different things. So one of your groups you might be pulling for a small group direct instruction based on where they are and what those students needs. Another group might be working on their instructional design. So that independent task working on maybe a choice board or playlist or a pathway. Or the third group could be working on a, a game that's going to help them in that, those skills, or it could be that they're working um, together on a project-based learning activity, but some type of collaboration together. And so those could be your three groups, and then you have your groups rotating every 15 minutes. And so that way you are meeting with your students and the other students are working on what they need to be working on. And then you come back together as a class, maybe you have an exit ticket or you share learnings or you have some type of academic conversation to wrap up the lesson. This can look the same no matter if you are virtual or in person or in a hybrid situation. If you're virtual, your check in your mini lesson could be um, what you start off with just like face to face and then you can group your students and do breakout rooms. And so they're, they're doing those, in, those um, asynchronously and then you're working with your small groups and then they can pop back in for the synchronous piece. Or if you're face to face, you can just rotate the groups um, in, your, in your classroom as well. I've also seen teachers where if they're in a hybrid situation, maybe they're teaching their mini lesson um, on the day that all the students are together and then they're making the rotation on the days that they are virtual. The second model is a workshop model, and this model really is um, looking at things a little bit differently where you as the teacher can meet students um, at more with their needs. This is where a lot of teachers can pull small groups and then have the other students working on an independent task, again, around an instructional design, could be a choice board, a playlist, or a pathway. But during that time, the teacher is checking in with the students. Maybe they're having a student-led conference. Maybe, again, they're having that small group instruction. But this is where they're having these two groups. But they have this common learning objective of a certain standard that they're all working on so that they also can help each other um, when they're doing their independent tasks. The next way is a flipped classroom. And flipped classroom can look different um, in all different settings. but one of the things you also want to think about when you're doing flipped classroom is making sure that you um, have it equitable for all students. So with a flipped classroom, you typically give the video prior to students coming to your face-to-face -face or your synchronous lesson, and they view that video. For me, I always gave my students a flip video on Monday and let them know by Friday they needed to watch the video. That way, um, if students didn't have internet access or other siblings were maybe on online and they, they weren't able to get computer access at home, they knew they, they had to figure out a, a time to get that video done throughout the week instead of just in one night. So 
Maybe they couldn't get to it Monday night, but Tuesday night was better. This also helped them think about time management with also sports and other activities. So it was another good life skill that they could do, but you wanna make sure that you're providing those structures for students so they can be successful with this. Then on Fridays when they came in, we often did either a station rotation or everybody did a, um, a collective PBL activity, depending on the data from when they came into the class and took that um, assessment to see where they were. Students really like this because they could go back to the video, stop the video. There's a lot of great digital tools out there like Edpuzzle that also help you do this as well so that you can um, get that data before the students even come into the classroom. So then you can um, start triangulating that, da that data from your data from the video, also your data from the informal assessment, and then when the students take their formative assessment or their entrance ticket. Then again, at the end, students can come back together. You can share your learnings or have them complete an exit slip. Something we're seeing a little bit more popular, especially those that have gone back virtually, is uh, another um, model called HyFlex. And this is where students actually have the choice if they want to attend the synchronous mini lesson or the asynchronous lesson. And so oftentimes what teachers do is they record their synchronous lesson. And if students couldn't meet um, during that time, or maybe they um, didn't, they felt like they already had mastered that skill, then they could do it asynchronously. And so they could watch it. So it takes a little bit of all the different models put together. And the students really have the choice deciding which model works for them. But the teacher's still meeting with them even um, though they're doing the videos asynchronously, still having that one-on-one -on -one conversation. So next we're gonna drive into data-driven dis decisions. And this is really using data to drive those small groups that we talked about um, and really thinking about how can we use those formative session strategies to help our students move and grow and take ownership. And so that's gonna look multiple ways and to think about things um, in your classroom. So the four things that we often tell teachers is you want to make sure that you know your purpose. What is your purpose of your formative assessment and how are what tools are you using um, to obtain that data? You also want to make sure you're collecting data over time. So for me, I always had a spreadsheet where I had multiple tabs, where I had the first one, first tab was assignments that they turned in, and it was either um, green, yellow, red, green, they turned it in, yellow, they partially did it, red, they didn't complete it. So I could quickly see and be able to help students with assignments. My second tab was around assessments where again it was green mastery, yellow partially partial mastery, and then um, red not mastered. So then I can also see which groups I want I needed to pull and that data was for me. Students also had their own student data notebook so they also knew what standards they were so they also had that ownership so we were both being able to come to our student-led conferences with that data to make sure that we were in sync. They also then knew what standards that they needed to focus on. The next thing is to really think about focusing on feedback. Providing students feedback is how they grow in their journey. And this feedback can be verbally during like those student-led conferences, but you can also do it asynchronously through like Google Docs or um, providing them email feedback as well. Lots of different ways where you can leverage this feedback so that they're growing in their journey. Um, formative assessments should never be an I got you or a grade. It's really to grow and show the growth over time for students so that they can have mastery when you do give that summative assessment. The next thing to think about is those in the moment checks for understanding. Um, so I talked a lot before about entrance tickets and exit tickets, but so you can see if they've mastered the standard or maybe the mini lesson that you gave. But you also want to think about um, things like how did the lesson go? Maybe you tried something new. So even just seeing if they feel confident, it could be a, a green, yellow, red, or a one, two, three, three being like top notch, two being like needs a little work, one's like, nope, this didn't work for me. So that you're also gaining assessment data back from them in a different way to change your craft and your instruction and get their feedback. So it's more of a, a we classroom versus a my classroom. And next, going into student reflection and ownership. Um, and that's really increasing the engagement 
in multiple ways, really trying to help students develop that metacognition to really think about their own thinking, but also reflecting on their um, student driven goals and having them reflect on those goals. So oftentimes we get teachers like, yes, my students set goals, um, but they never reflect on them. And that metacognition is really important to be able to have students take ownership. And so really encouraging not only setting goals, but also reflecting on those goals. Also offering students choice. It, oftentimes we get teachers that say, well, I'm, I'm really nervous that if I provide all these choices, they're not gonna pick the right choice or they're gonna pick the easiest choice. Well, there shouldn't be an easy choice. Everything should have the same rigor and relevance in a task that they have. And then also you don't have to give, you know, a hundred choices or 10 choices. It can be just two, you know, you can do this task or this task, both the same standard, both being able to show mastery, but maybe one is showing it in a creative way where they're building a, um, a commercial to show that what they know or maybe one is they're creating a book. And so maybe one, a student would rather do it in a video and a student rather do it writing. So it's two different ways. They're both showing mastery, but they have that choice of how they want it to, how they want it to look. And then just providing those opportunities where they can take autonomy. And example of that can also be like we, like we suggested that student data notebook where they can then show what they know um, as well. Other ways for students to really take ownership is to think about talk time and making sure that all students have a voice. Even small strategies like think, pair, share, those are strategies you still can do when you're um, online and teaching in a virtual, in a virtual environment. Giving, them, giving students that time to really think something through and then being able to collaborate with others before a big group discussion. So maybe it's a, they do a breakout and it's a smaller group dis discussion. One thing to really note is thinking about that wait time. Um, in classrooms, teachers are great about giving that 30 second wait time. When you're in the virtual world, you wanna give longer wait time. Research shows that you really wanna think about it to being closer to a minute, because not only are you having to process that information, but you also typically have to type it into like a chat box or you're taking notes in a different thing, in a different way. And so you wanna give them a little bit longer of a process time so they can make that thinking visible. Also sharing um, their screen. You know, there's lots of different whiteboards and tools that you can use to share your screen and having students show their work just like you would in a classroom um, so that we can learn from each other. And that really gives students ownership over their work and realizes that other people are going to be looking at that as well. And then the next one is publishing. You know, we are in, in um, a world where everybody loves to publish um, their work because they want to get the reactions from others and be able to get that peer feedback as, feedback as well. So having students create digital portfolios where they have put their work up online or having students write a blog instead of writing in a journal so that they can have peers looking at it, they could have parents looking at it. And so it really also teaches them those 21st century skills um, of critical thinking and communicating, collaborating. And that's a great way for students also to be able to show what they know in a different, in a different way and not just be for the eyes of the teacher. The um, next one and last one is um, flexible content and tools. And this one is really thinking about how you can blend online and offline curriculum, really thinking about what the pace, the path and that content looks like. Um, and really thinking about how can you find ways to leverage your targeted groups that we talked about and really meeting the students where they are through, through the data to be able to provide that ownership. And there are multiple ways you can do that, but the three ways we're gonna be focusing on is that instructional design. And so this is the part where everybody loves to look at the choice board playlists and pathways. Teachers find that they really want to start here because they know standards, they, they understand this, um, but you have to have a lot of the other pieces in place in order to be successful with, the, with these instructional designs. And what I mean by that is if you haven't been using data such as pre-assessments to be able to determine what students know and don't know, it's going to be really hard for you to do a playlist or a pathway. 
So let me break this down a little bit more for you though, so you can start seeing how you can take some next steps to be able to create instructional designs in your classroom. So for choice boards, that's where you have standards and you have choice. Um, and so when I work with teachers on creating choice boards, I tell them a few things. One, which I've already stated, is making sure all the choices that are on the choice board have the same rigor and relevance. There should be no easy one that students pick. The second thing is making sure you don't have what we call fake choice. So maybe you give a choice board that lasts Monday through Friday, um, and when they get to Friday, they only have one task left. Something really simple you can do is just having six tasks. So by the end, when they get down to the final two on that Friday, they at least still have a choice um, that they can do the task. And then also thinking about the third thing is making sure that it, this is standards based. This shouldn't be um, what students do if they finish something early. This should really be driving their learning. And so oftentimes I'll get people that say, oh, I've done choice board or, or um, a tic-tac-toe board or something like that. And they show me something, but it's all just tasks if they finish early. This is definitely standard driven. And so the students are gonna be working on different standards based on their needs. The next, and we'll go to some examples of these two. The next one is playlist, and that's really taking a pre-assessment. Based on that pre-assessment, students are going to start at a different point within their standards, and they're going to be working at, at a different pace. So some students might start at the very top of their playlist, where um, they have maybe have to do a fourth grade standard, even though it's a fifth grade um, playlist, because they have to close some of those gaps in order to be successful with this standard. Or some of the students already mastered part of the standard, so they're going to start maybe in the middle of the pathway. Or you could have a student that's already mastered the, st the standard, so now they're going to that higher order thinking where they're doing a project-based learning activity. So students are going to be at a different pace, um, but also working on that same standard. And then a pathway, I say, is when a choice board and a playlist get together, you have a pathway. So you have pre-assessment data, you have standards and now you also have pace, but you're allowing that voice and choice as well. So students pick maybe um, you have three tasks, they pick two out of the three tasks. Based off of that, they meet with you, they have a, um, a conference. And so then from that conference, you can say, okay, you know what, Johnny, I really think that you need to practice this skill. Why don't you do this, ta this next task to see if you mastered it or you're like, you're doing great, I want you to take a real-time check-in data, whatever, however that looks for your district, before the students moves on. So that way you're really triangulating that data between the informal conversation through the tasks and then also with a real-time checkpoint as well. So let's look at what some of these could look like in different grade levels. So here you can see two different choice boards. Um, the one on the left, the rocks and minerals, a fourth grade um, starting um, science here, and then you have high school um, science as well. So two totally different ones, but both based on standards. And you can see that they have to pick three um, out of the nine choices that they have. Could either of these choice boards, choice boards only be six and have like two rows with those with three columns, absolutely. These, these teachers chose to do it two different, different ways here, but you can see that they're all um, on the same standard. Next, a playlist is um, a little bit different. Again, two examples where some students are going to start up here at the top because they haven't mastered multiplying and um, multiplying large numbers, but in order for them to be successful with the decimals, they need to have that. And then some students might be already to converting decimals to fractions. So they're going to start at a different place on the um, choice or on the playlist. And again, on further down, there might be a PBL. This one is um, a high school one, but thinking about, about the playlist in based on skills versus standard, which is fine. So they took a pre-assessment based on the based on their skills. They're starting in different places and then working through the sequences of labs. And you can see all the links to each of their different pieces. So if they needed a review because they didn't really remember parts of speech and um, grammar and capitalizing and things like that, then they're going to start here where some kids are going to start at the second piece where they're crafting their punctuation. And then there's a third a third sequence that some of the students could be starting at. So you can also do it by sections like that to break it up. 
And then the um, next one is that pathway. And you can see um, a path grade, fifth grade pathway and a first grade pathway. So it looks a little different here for both of them, but the same kind of thing where the teacher on the left with a fifth grade, they chose to use three different learning modalities, um, listening, seeing, and writing and creating. So students get to pick two of these choices. And then from the two of these choices, they um, then had a small group conference or they had a teacher conference with them to go over it and then a checkpoint in order to determine if they're ready to go on to the next um, row. Oftentimes I see teachers using a lot of Bloom's taxonomy so that they're starting off with the lower Blooms and working up to higher to also see where the students is having any type of misconception or any trouble um, with this standard as well. Then you can see the first um, grade pathway here where the teacher uh, integrated the Common Core uh, reading and writing together and the students are picking strategies based on their just right book. So no matter what their reading level is, they're still working on the first grade strategies and, and standards, but working on books that are just their level and they get to pick whichever two strategies they want to do. You can also see that they have the same kind of setup that their checkpoint is they're checking in for a conference or a um, small group direct instruction as well. So we have talked about a lot of different things, breaking down these core four. And so now going into our practice and plan, wanted to provide you with some resources. So um, here is a core four resource explanation kind of document where we have provided with you videos, different grade levels spanning from K through high school. And you can pick one area you wanna focus in on. We um, really encourage you to pick one of the core four to focus in on that you want to grow in. It could be something that you've already like partially mastered and you wanna make sure you master it, or it could be something that you have not mastered that you wanna to move to partially mastered. It doesn't matter. You get to choose which one you wanna focus in on. And from there, you can see what it looks like in different grade levels. So if you follow this bit.ly up here at the corner, and then we'll also provide this in the resource guide, you will see um, this exact document where you can click on all of these videos so you can actually see what it looks like in a grade level that's similar to yours. As we know, that's oftentimes really hard to, um, to determine what it could look like for a kindergarten teacher or for a high school because it is very different, but still um, they can um, really have ownership, they can have targeted instruction, they can make data-driven decisions and have that flexible um, tools and content as well. All right, so I look forward to hearing some of your questions and um, remember you can ask them in the Twitter chat as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can have a discussion. Awesome. Well, that was a wonderful presentation, Jill. You shared a ton of information, which I think is like crucial for uh, personalized learning and, and doing all of that. I think the first question I immediately that comes to mind is you shared so much information and resources. Where should somebody start if they want to get started with the core four and get started with these personalized learning practices? Yeah, great question. I usually tell teachers, pick whichever one you feel most comfortable with, but if you're not even sure from there which one you wanna start with, student ownership is the biggest one to really focus in on because once students have ownership and understand um, goal setting and reflecting, that's really starting them to think about learning as a journey and not just learning for a grade. And that's really ultimately what we want is that mastery piece. So that's a good place to start. That's really good advice. I think the focusing on the, the student and not the grade is so important. Um, kind of shifting to that, one thing that stood out to me from what you talked about is the whole child and understanding strengths and areas of growth and kind of that pre-assessment process. What observations or advice do you have for either teachers and educators who might still be in remote learning or transitioning back to the classroom? Should they be kind of reevaluating um, that students' areas of growth and, and how that kind of shifted during the remote learning environment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so working with teachers, I tell them, you definitely wanna have a lot more one-on-one -on -one in the front, to really get to know the students and see where those gaps are. Cause not only do you have the summer slide, but you also have now the COVID slide too. And so you wanna see um, where the student is. Um, without making assumptions. Oftentimes we just assume as teachers like, oh, well, they haven't had this content before, so they're not gonna know this. Um, but 
you never know, they could have been going to all their classes. They could have been going on Khan Academy or another tool to learn different skills that um, they haven't been, haven't been necessarily taught to, but they learned a different way. So not making those assumptions, really talking to kids, having them show what they know in different ways. I also encourage um, to really start off slow to go fast in, in um, personalized learning. So starting off slow, meaning like if you are doing virtual learning and you're using a learning management system or new tool, be vulnerable and share, hey, we're gonna learn this new tool together, doing that with them to help build those relationships that way. And then say, you know, if you do fail or something does happen and mess up, you know, celebrating that and say, all right, well, now I know I can't do X, Y, or Z, I'm going to move forward. Because then it shows students that um, it, that learning process and that you learn from failure, but that you also um, need sometimes those productive struggles and to step outside your comfort zone as well. So modeling that builds that relationship too. And then I've been encouraging teachers because a lot of them are like, well, I don't know what they know or don't know about like the learning management system to be able to do instructional designs or models like you talked about. And so in the beginning, you know, doing a scavenger hunt with whatever learning management system or a tool, like doing it in a very safe way is a great way, but then you can also get to know your students. So maybe have them upload in an assignment, but that assignment be something that's going to help you get to know them. So maybe it's like a survey that you've created or, you know, it's a bit emoji locker that we've been seeing, things like that. So you're getting to know the student in a different way, but then they're also practicing the skills. So you're setting up that safe learning environment. I love that idea. And I think there have been so many tools and technologies that have come about during remote learning. It's important to, like you said, not make assumptions and make sure that teachers are getting to learn those at their own pace because um, that's so important. So two more questions. One, um, and this is something we talked about prior to um, your presentation, but how do you plan for personalized learning? What's the best way to kind of plan this process and make sure that it is going to be as effective as possible in your school or district? Yeah, oftentimes I get teachers who are like, very, this is overwhelming. I want to do all these things. I don't know where to start or how, how can I work? You really, um, need to do this together with your PLC or, or with people that are doing the same um, tasks as you. So that when you're coming together, a lot of these things you already have in place, you already have tasks that are based on standards. So if you're thinking about an instructional design to, such as choice board playlist or pathway, come together as a PLC and in divide and conquer and say, all right, well, we're teaching fractions this next unit. You bring something for 5.NF1, you bring something for 5.NF2 and NF3 and start putting together in this like different structure so that you can work smarter, not harder, because you have a lot of these tools and resources already created. It's just putting in that little different format. Then it also often get, well, how do you know if you should do like choice board versus a playlist versus a pathway? And I always um, tell teachers that um, for my for choice boards in my classroom, I use those for standards that maybe in the scope and sequence for only a couple days. So no pre-assessment needed. It's just a couple days in the unit versus the playlist and pathways is where like I really put a lot more emphasis on those power standards. So I knew if it was a power standard, I knew it was going to be like a six to eight week unit and lots of different pieces within those standards. I would create pathways because then I could have that triangulation of data to be able to, to move um, to make sure that they had that true mastery. I think another thing that teachers can um, do with that is um, take one unit at a time and backwards map so they know, okay, this is everything I want my student to learn the first quarter. And then from there, think about different um, little benchmarks that you want to have. So if you want, if you create these playlists or pathways, you have like, okay, I know that I want students to complete these four pathways within this quarter. So these are kind of the rough estimate of times that they should be on because you really want to encourage that pace because they might fly through geometry, but get stuck during fractions. And so you want to like make sure there's a little bit of buffer, but also um, give them that time to be able to have that productive struggle to be able to work through that too. That's really good advice. I think that that will help a lot of people who are trying to get started. Um, okay, one last question. You shared the core four. You said at the end, you know, focus on one that you think you know, need the most improvement on um, or just or one that you would would like to improve on. If people, you know, feel that they need to improve on all four, where would you recommend they start? Which one do you think is kind of the most impactful or important to start off with? Yeah, knowing your data is really important to be able to help with all the other pieces, the other core four. So 
Um, oftentimes as teachers, we collect just so much data, but we don't necessarily use that data to drive the instruction. So really thinking about how can you use that data to make steps in the next um, instruction that you're doing. So you're starting off small, especially things like entrance and exit tickets, like giving an exit ticket, just seeing if students master that concept that you just taught to then next day know which groups that you need to pull for reteach or to move on to the next um, standard or concept. That's great advice. I agree. I think as a marketer, data is so important and, and, and looking through that data, we collect it all the time and making sure you're looking through it, understanding what it means and then using it to kind of grow as an educator is, is really impactful. So I thank you so much, Jill, for that presentation and sharing your expertise. Is there anything that you're working on, have coming up that you want to plug for the audience? Um, I know they can also engage with you on Twitter using the hashtag um, and ask you any additional questions they may have. Yeah, follow me on Twitter. Um, you can see everything that I'm involved in there um, from my weekly blogs to actually just launched my YouTube channel yesterday, um, talking with EDU Thompson, where I'm talking to different educators. So another great place to just learn and grow together because we're all in this together and we can only get better together. So love to hear your questions um, and looking forward to talking to you all more. Yes, we're all in this together and we thank you for being with us today. Um, we hope that everyone can join us tomorrow for the STEM session with Chris Woods, as well as for the rest of the week. And don't forget to put your questions in the Twitter chat for Jill to um, engage with you further on personalized learning. Thank you so much, Jill, for being with us today. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop recording. Um,